Hello. Another busy day. Well, actually, today was the day I took the um, fluffy research assistant to the poodle parlor. So that's why it's, everything's taken a bit longer today. That and. Well, to be honest, research, uh, redoing part four of this and getting Japan up to go. So Japan is possibly going to end up being recorded and aired before, so the Anglo-Japanese relations in 1902 to 1942 is possibly going to end up being recorded before part four of the amphibious warfare. Literally because this is a great guide and basis for parts one to three, okay? Or so our sections one to three of part two. But section four, which you're looking at the headquarters ships and all those, is... There's so much stuff that's not been written down and it's all spread about and I'm bringing it together. So that might well be a feature later in the week. Maybe after messing. Messing's looking quite fun. That's Tuesday and hopefully I'll have everything working with the new live setup over the computer. Hey. So, question of getting them there. Landing ships in amphibious warfare. Today we're looking at the most famous of all, landing ship tanks. So, Group 3, ships for tanks and vehicles. Okay, LSTs, they come in three variants, and there's all sorts of stories about why they, the, the, the different variants come about and where these different variants are. Here's the skinny. There are six LST ones. They're of two classes. Three are conversions, three are new builds. So I'll go into both sets of them. The picture here is of one of the conversions, and it's HMS Bakro, which I talked about during Operation Ironclad. Remember, she was there. She was taking on a whole lot of stuff. This is her later in the war at Broughton Harbour in Algeria. Um, loading Bren gun carriers, I think. Then there's the landing ship tank Mark II. That's pretty much the British going to the Americans. What we really need is an Atlantic crossing landing craft tank. The Americans going, oh, that's an amazing idea. And they're building it and it, because it can cross the Atlantic itself under its own power without being broken up in bits, it becomes a landing ship tank because it can cross an ocean. So it's a landing ship. And then there's the landing ship Mark III. Okay. The British have come up with the idea and the Americans are building it. The Americans are building great guns. But they're getting a bit... prissy by 1943 about where the British are using them. And whether the British are going to be able to use them on their solo operations which they're planning. Especially in the Far East. There are reasons for this. The Americans see the Pacific War very much as their war in certain areas. Admiral King, etc. And... It's easier in the nicest way. They don't want the British coming in too much because they're looking already at the post-war world. They're looking at their emerging power and it's realism. It's not them being nasty. It's them being realistic and practical. They want to do the job because it's important for them to beat Japan after what Japan did at Pearl Harbor. They don't want the British coming in and stealing the limelight. No, that's a bit cruel. Um... It's not that they don't want the British coming to see in the limelight. They just want the stuff to be under their control and doing what they want to do. They don't want the British coming in and going, ah, but we think we're going to do this. They want everything to be going, we're in charge. So, and you can understand that. It's, it's the fear that they've been taking the lead and they've been fighting. The British turning up and suddenly going, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. That's going to annoy them. But the British do want to turn up and do this and this because they've lost bits. And they have, because they've been fighting the war in Europe and fighting the war in the Mediterranean and doing all the other stuff around the world, they haven't been able to go back and retake those bits. So they want them back. 
So basically, the LST threes are the British going, right then, we need to build our own. And if we're going to build our own, we're going to build them slightly better. Yeah. Hey. You know, it happens. This time, though, we link up with the Canadians to do the building. Yeah. You can trust the Canadians. They won't take your ideas and um, then take control of it. It's one of those scenarios where I can be snarky from both sides, and I would quite happily, especially if I was doing a big lecture and I had the students in front of me. Um, because both sides have reasons to be snarky. You know, the Americans, of course they want to be in control. The Pacific is, it's their war. After Pearl Harbor, it's their war. They're taking control of it, charge of it. Everyone else is sort of backing them up as part of them, and they want to be lead. The British are a big power. And most importantly, they have a big power mentality. So, yes, Britain is putting, is quite happy to allow American officers to be in charge of operations, to be the Supreme Commander of Allied Forces Europe and all this sort of thing. Yeah. But they expect a very big say in what's going on as well. They expect a big, they expect to be listened to. And in Europe, America does have to listen to Britain. I, I know this might upset some people, but they do. And they do in the Mediterranean. They do listen. And the British, in many ways, quite a lot of the strategy of what happens in Europe is dictated by Britain. We let the Americans be in charge as long as we're basically calling the shots in terms of this is how we're going to approach this. This is what we need to do. And this is the rough timetable we need to follow. And it's important. We can only do that, though, whilst we're a big power at the table. It's the same. The trouble is in the Far East is the Americans don't want us coming out there because they're not happy having to deal with that as well. And suddenly they won't get to do necessarily how they want to. And they import, it's important to America that they do it how they want to. But the British are, it's important to the British to get out there, to recapture those lands they've lost, to protect their parts of the empire. Because... If they don't do that, then they lose national prestige. They lose their self-image of being this big empire, this global empire, which they've been all themselves on. So it's important to both sides. Anyway. Landing ship tanks, Mark 1, Group 1. So, landing ship tanks, Mark 1. They are a lovely little class of conversions, which are the Machiavo class. And I have probably mangled that most profusely, and I apologise now to my girlfriend, who spent a good 20 minutes on the phone today trying to tell me how to pronounce it, because my Spanish is terrible, and hers is excellent. In fact, my languages as a whole, the foreign languages, are terrible. So if I mispronounce things, please, have no qualms. Tell me I'm wrong. I, I prefer to pronounce them correctly. Uh, I make a stab at things. I don't do it well. Um, pretty much, this is again the British going for a conversion. They have an idea. They want to do it. The conversion turns out quite well. But its top speed is limited to 10 knots because they're not that fast. And... Honestly, they can't carry a lot. Um, it's 20, 25 ton tanks or 18 Churchills uh, later, and they carry two LCMs. They don't really have, in terms of deck space. So one of the interesting things which you find with later LSTs, they have a lot of stuff stored on multiple levels. These, the first ones don't. The first ones really, these conversions do not. However, they are an incredibly useful proof of concept. But they have things like, because they have a door at the front, they have a flat bow. And all these things which limit their speed and limit their utility, which actually slow down the forces they're with. So if you can imagine, they're limited to 10 knots. That's the maximum they can do. So any convoy they're with is limited to 10 knots. And in reality, that's going to be 9 knots. Because you're going to want to... 10 knots is not their most economical speed. Okay? So the moment you have these ships involved, they are limiting your amphibious forces' capabilities. They also drink fuel. 
literally. But saying all that, they are oil tankers and they're converted. But there is no Makiaru class. Um, Makiaru, HMS Makiaru. They are HMS Misoa, HMS Tajira, and HMS Bakaro. Of course, we know Bakaro. She was the one at going down to Madagascar for Operation Ironclad. So they are there. They are used. They are very useful. But, yeah. Have a look at that plan, please. Go back to the pit when I had it up on the screen and have a look at that plan. That is a conversion and a half, but um, there's a repair bay sitting in the middle of it. I can understand you having a repair bay. A repair bay does make sense, especially as that means you can load up tanks which might not be in the best condition and you can fix them en route. But wouldn't you stick the repair bay, I don't know, at the back so that the working tanks can get out the door easily? Uh, in theory, yes, they can go round them, but still, it's in the middle of the front. <laughs> I have to remember they are compromises. They are compromises. But why? In the middle? <sighs> Sorry. We'll quickly move on to the next class, the first purpose built ones. These are the Boxer class. Now, you'll notice very quickly, I have a picture of HMS Bruiser here. I don't have a picture of HMS Boxer. That's because she's going to come up in part four, uh, in um, section four. The reason she's going to, because she's converted, because the Royal Navy goes, you know what, we have these ships with a huge amount of space and power generation and they're fast and this, we can use them for other things. Anyway, so after Macarabas, what the Royal Navy's done is gone, we need 17 knots. We don't want to be so slow anymore. We want our task groups to have a chance of getting there. Sorry, bad Scottish accent coming through. Um, but they do. They they want their sh uh, their, them to get there. But the trouble is, for them to get there and do the 17 knots, you need to come up with a whole new bow, hence the bow doors come in, the really cool systems which go like that. And the reason they're like that is they're not really watertight or that brilliant, but they are great at cutting the water and speeding your ship up going through the water. It's amazing. You put a pointy end on the front of the ship and the ship goes faster. Yay. Um, they have a deeper hull. Because they have a deeper hull, they can't actually get into the two foot six inch of waters they're supposed to be to drop off the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the vehicles. In fact, it's more like five feet, maybe six feet of clearance is about their limit. So, to get the extra <clears throat> to that point, they have a minimum requirement for a hundred foot bridge to come out the front. Ends up being enough to give them 140 foot close enough to sort of get there. Great. But you're now carrying a 140 foot bridge, okay? So let's think about this. You are stocking a 140 foot of bridge inside you, which might explain why they could only carry 13 Churchills inside. But they could carry 27 military trucks, um, which military trucks, medium trucks, or military transports. The thing is, when I read this book, which I'm using, as I said, as my spine guide, it uses MT to mean all three at different times, okay? In the same chapter. It's the one critique I have. Well, I have a couple of others, but it's better than all the rest. So, I'm going for medium truck, military truck, uh, probably being about the correct idea. And there is a spelling mistake there in Sidea. Not sure how they got it. Okay, I proofread this on everything. Ah, well. The thing is, these are actually very good ships. They have a lot of space in them and they are very high quality. 
But the trouble is, they're difficult to, difficult to build. And you'll notice, please note, that whilst there is a workshop at front, uh, the stores are all at the back here, and they haven't mentioned it, but I do know for a fact that these, the maintenance area for the tank, the repair area, was in the rear. Okay, it was in the stern. Someone had been thinking. Um, but they also have a lift. They have a vehicle lift on them, which comes up. And actually comes up here underneath the bridge area. And so that's your sort of lift entrance in that area. And the vehicles can be stored out the front there. They have a 40-ton crane on the back, which can lift on and off LCMs and all sorts of other things. They are very, very capable ships. In fact, honestly, you could say they're almost the forerunner of the modern LSLs in the terms of the concept of what they wanted to fulfill. So they're good. I like these. But only three are built. Okay. And that is HMS Boxer, HMS Bruiser and HMS Froster. No, I'm not sure. They apparently couldn't up come up with another B name. HMS Buster, HMS whatever. But no, they go with HMS Froster. She was a very frosting ship, apparently. So, next slide. LST2s. So, as I said at the beginning, what the Royal Navy wanted was a landing craft tank which could cross the Atlantic Ocean. What they got was an LST-2. <sighs> Look, the Americans are lovely. And what they do is they go, right, and we'll put in some diesel engine to make it all electric. But we rather like the bow doors. And we sort of like some of the ramping that you got from the uh, LST-1. So we'll nick those, and those are good. And we'll put in a vehicle lift, although they stick it at the front. And they have a hatch and they stick all the accommodate all the sort of accommodations that are on the side and everything. It's it's a really good design in in function many, many ways. Um, personally myself, I think it shows the priority of what was supposed to get there. Because these ships were capable of about ten knots. So if they're that slow and they're that mm, uh, one, it would expect that if anything's going to hit, it's going to be the outer side thing. So you've got the tank stored on the inside and the accommodation around the outside. Tanks are difficult to buy. Um, but no. Actually, very few do get hit. And that's to do with all the escorts that are given them, all the protection that's put in place for these all the firepower that goes into the, into the landings and these things, LSTs are actually very survivable. Partially because by the time they get close to anywhere where they're going to be fighting, there is no one sitting in the accommodation. So the accommodation areas become this sort of... How do I put this? This sort of insulation, this protection, bubble, protective bubble around everything else that's there that you don't want to get hurt. So you have a sort of case of this sort of outer wall. And it works. And they're fairly good. They can carry 18 Churchills plus 27 MT, which is listed as military transport this time, and eight Jeeps. Or, as we all know, an LCT-5. Yep. These were the ships which had the LCT-5 fitted. The least said about that, the better. Seriously, the least said about it, the better. It was so sane. It was going so well. Let me put an LCT-5 on top. Seriously, what is it with amphibious shipping? The more I look into them, the more I think that whoever was designing really was just going... Yeah, we'll just cram that in, this in, this in, that in. Oh, we can do that, we can do that. Seriously. Calm it. 
Build small ships. Make them uh, stop adding so much in and make them less complicated. You might get more out. Anyway, LCT, well, LST freeze. So, these again are products because Britain's going, but we want to, and America going, mm -hmm. and as I said at the beginning, you can understand both sides. But these are interesting. They're interesting to me for two main reasons. One, they're carrying pontoons on the outside. If you consider, again, the modern British system of Mexi floats, okay, which can be powered, but they're not necessarily always powered, so they can be used as straight normal pontoons and all sorts of things, it's very close to the modern system. They've got a pontoon on them. They are capable of carrying about the same number of tanks and vehicles as the LST-2s, but they're a little bit faster. And they're a little bit faster because the Royal Navy goes, these are so important, we are going to use frigate engines for them. Not only that, we're going to use the yards which are building frigates. So they are being built by yards which are used to building to what are semi, pretty much naval standards at this time. And there is a slight difference between naval standards and merchantile standards. Um, they're cute. They work well, and they're very good. But here's my point about why they're for a war in the Pacific. They are ordered in 1943 to be delivered by, they wanted to have 80 ships by spring 1945. In 1943, they know that D-Day is going to be pretty much in 1944. That's what the plans are for. So if you're ordering something in 1943, spring 1945, you know it's not going to be there for D-Day. So you are not building this for Europe. And the first was delivered in December 1944. Well after D-Day. They are being built for the Pacific War. They are being built for the invasion of Singapore and invasion of Japan. Sometimes. Also, to next slide. So, we've been talking about it, but everything builds up to Operation Overlord or D Day. Now, why have I brought this up? Well, I wanted to clear up a few popular myths. And I'll probably do more about D-Day in the future, but I wanted to do something quickly. As I'm doing landing craft and landing ships, it seems sensible to cover a bit of D-Day. Um, I did Operation Ironclad last time. And I've done Operation Claymore as well. So every time of these I do, one's a little amphibious operation. And now I'm going for a not amphibious operation. Ooh, that's going to cause trouble. So let me explain. Techni a technical definition of amphibious operation is a force that's based from the sea attacks the shore. It's maneuver from the sea. Okay. D-Day must be an amphibious operation, and then they're, cro they, they're crossing the channel. Well, they're not based from the sea. If they'd had to sail a long way and operate and they were literally launching them from the sea, that would be one thing. But they're not. In fact, many of the landing craft, especially the larger ones, are coming straight from the UK. It's pretty much a very expanded river crossing. I know. It's counterintuitive. The largest amphibious operation in history, the one which everyone talks about, is not actually technically an amphibious operation. Because... They are not launching from the sea. They're launching from the land and they're going to another land. It's a shore to shore maneuver. It's a rather than a ship to shore maneuver. 
It's massive, though. This is one of the, a picture of the American beach. I have been hunting for some of the pictures of the British beaches, but didn't take them. This is after the initial D-Day. I think it's D plus one or D plus two. I'm, the details on the picture are scratchy. But just look at all the ships there. Look at all the LSTs and, if you look carefully, LCTs. All there. You're getting thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people moving. Equipment, all sorts of things across. It's ginormous, the enterprise they're doing. And then start thinking about when did they start building the amphibious forces for this. They started building the equipment which would be used for this, basically to build up towards D-Day, which takes place in 1944, in 1940. It takes four years to amass the equipment. So again, the reason I'm doing this, twofold. One, I want to do a little thing about it not being an amphibious operation technically, mainly because I know that's going to cause some fun discussions. Two, because every time I read on the internet, and I have seen a lot of them recently, and they tend to multiply as you get closer and closer to June, the idea that the Allies could have launched D-Day earlier, that they didn't because they wanted to make the Russians lose more people and all sorts of things, or they didn't care about the Holocaust or all this stuff. It absolutely infuriates me. It takes years to build ships. You then have to crew them. You're not going to ask them to do an easy operation. They're going to be conducting what is one of the most difficult operations you can do. Because most of these ships, these landing craft, these LSTs... Basically, what they're doing is a controlled beaching, a con which is another name for a crash into shore. And they have to do it in such a way that they not only their cargo survives and can offload, they can get back out to sea and go and get another load and come back again. Because it's not just the first wave which is going to be critical of this operation. It's going to be the second wave, the third wave, the fourth wave, and every single other wave that comes after it. Because... No battle, in this case, is going to be won by the, uh, by the first wave alone. He's not even going to be won by the first day alone. Because we talk about D-Day as being a battle, but then it goes into the Battle of Normandy. Where, again, there are reinforcements coming across the beaches are critical to that. Then it's the Battle of, basically, the Second Battle of France. And then it's all the way across through the Low Countries. And all the fighting that takes place. You have to keep those supplies coming. You have to keep those people coming. So if you put untrained crews in there, yes, you might have the ships. Oh, you know what? The ship's being built. But the crews have only been in it for a week or so. They haven't done any exercises. You cannot go. Because they'll go, but most of them will break their ships. In which case, there's no follow-up ways. In which case, what you end up with is a quagmire in the Normandy area, and it doesn't work. So, my little missive. Over the day is over. Next slide. Pictures. Yeah. An LST free with launching ways on the deck for I'm presuming from the way it looks, LCMs. That definitely looks like that was another idea. Rather than just carrying an LCT five, you could carry a whole host of LCMs, and you could launch them. Again, it's a ten foot drop. You're just being cruel. They have feeling ships, you know. You're just chucking it off the side with ten foot drop. No, no, okay. No. Let's go on to the far prettier image, okay? Let the let more stress, a less stressful one. The LST-1. Now, here's the other thing that annoys me. 
is that picture actually comes from this book, right? Most of these pictures sort of do come from these books. But if anyone should know it, the author of this set of this paper, and actually the paper on landing craft, is um, Mr. Baker. Now, Mr. Baker goes is a actual member, and if I can find it, is a constri is um, the current when he's uh, around. This is a chief constructor, naval construction department of the Admiralty. And was actually in charge, or heavily involved and later on in charge, of the building of landing craft and landing ships and their design and development during the World War II. He was basically Stanley Goodall's deputy in charge of that section. If anyone should know which one of those ships that is, he should. He designed it. It's like a father not knowing and recognising his children. Mine was occasionally drunk. I was occasionally pretty drunk. He always worked out which one was which. Admittedly, only had a son and a daughter, so you know, life's easier that way. But yeah, still, there's only three in that class. Well, next slide. Ah, oh, now. So you can see some tanks embarked. Now, those who are more tank savvy will probably be able to work out what tanks those are. I have a sneaking suspicion, but what I'm going to do is ask for people who uh, to comment below as to what tanks they think this picture is. I have a sneaking suspicion from the insignia and from what I've looked at. But I could be wrong, and I don't want to influence it either way. It's not as if I've spent a lot of time at a tank museum. No. Love these evolution shirts. Anyway. And this is a picture is, of course, HMS Thruster. The special admiralty design for LSTs. She has such a long appendage which comes out and you know this bridge is such a, a long thing which comes out towards the beach i'm going to stop making crude jokes i do promise but it's hms thruster and she's got a very very large extending bridge fitted okay today might have been a bit of a long day so next slide Right, uh, three. Basically, it gives you a nice idea that there isn't really much different. In many ways, the LST three is a slightly built up LST two. Um, you can uh, the LST two is built for mass production. The LST three is built by a nation which is looking, it knows it can't do as much mass production as the LST twos, so it's going for a slightly better in every little way so that it gets slightly more out of each individual unit. But they are very, very similar. Okay, I have a feeling next slide is the final slide for this video. Yes, it is. Okay, so those who watch my Twitter feed well, no, a few weeks back, I had a bit of a revelation about HMS Buolodo. I'd forgotten her. That sounds terrible. Um, basically, I was looking up Operation Torch and looking into it, and I could not find Admiral Burroughs, Vice Admiral Burroughs, um, headquarters ship. And I was not sure which of the battleships it was. Da -da 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 -da. I was looking through all the battleships. I'm going, no, no, that's the guy who's in charge of Force H. That's his battleship. Which battleship is Burroughs on? Only after I had a conversation with Armoured Carriers, the gentleman who runs Armoured Carriers, um, that we realised we 
well, he really, he point reminded me of Adrian Buller, and I found out all about her. And she disappears from the history. In fact, most of this group, which is Section 4, or Group 4, um, the headquarters ships and Group 5 miscellaneous, they're basically, I've combined these two into the four sections that's going to be produced, because I was looking at roughly four types in each one, and this was two types in each, and it just seemed silly to do a two-type video instead of one four-type. So it's headquarter ships, fighter direction tenders, fighter direction ships. Yes, we do find it that those things are separate. And then repair ships. So far, there is nothing in this book about any of them. So, I'm doing a lot of research for this. And as why I say, it might be held up. I might record that video at another point later in the week. Or it might go up tomorrow. I might, while I'm putting the finishing touches to the Japanese presentation, the Anglo-Japanese presentation, I might find it and go, you know what? I can do this. I can put it all together and record it tomorrow. But anyway, take care. Hope you've enjoyed section three. Have a nice evening. Well, day. Thank you for watching.